Welcome to the Executive Innovation Show podcast, where we bring you real executive conversations with industry game changers and thought leaders. We ask the questions you're thinking, what you're scared to ask, and we make your brain hurt afterward. With your host, Carrie Chitsy Wells, co-founder and CEO of One Touch Video Chat, live video interviews, and the nonprofit Humans Helping Humans. Everybody and welcome to today's show. We have an amazing show today. We're going to be talking about will hospice need to innovate with the silver tsunami brought to you by One Touch Telehealth. Got two amazing guests on the show today. First, we have Carla Braveman, who's the CEO of Hospice and Palliative Care Association in New York State. Prior to joining the state association, she's been in executive leadership positions in the health system, freestanding home health, and hospice agencies in multiple states. She also serves on multiple national and state boards relative to the field. Later in the show, we're going to be talking to Dr. Cheryl Nella Kelvin, who's a surgeon by training, currently the CEO of United Apollo International, a global health organization that bridges the gap in senior health care. She's also CEO of Epic Vascular Miami and New York, serving the entire state of Florida and New York as well as president of Blue Horizons Home Hospice in Austin, the first hospice organization to incorporate telehealth. Carla, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Well, great. There's been a lot of hot topics kind of lately and hospice and really the aging boomers at home, the shortage in skilled nursing, long-term care facilities, and then really the role of Gen Xers who are now in this first time caregiver, family hospice, um, in this kind of critical situation that we've never been in before and asking a lot more kind of questions than we may have seen in the past. Um, The real kind of debate is, you know, as we hear all the time, boomers want to age at home, boomers want to age at home. um, And that really puts hospice in a situation where we don't live in the environment in in today's society where we bring in mom and dad to live us, you know, live with us in the home culturally, that's relevant. Um, But in today's society where you have two working households, it kind of puts a lot of onus on hospice to really figure out how to be in all these places at once, how to have this increase in calls and anxiety and, and things like that. Where do you see with the boomers aging at home, the facility base versus in home? Like, where do we see that growth? I know in other countries, it's more facility based than home. Where do you kind of see all that? And and what are you kind of hearing with the association and all these hospice agencies from a concern in the future? There's a lot of concern in the future, both from the families not able or willing Um, to do the work that they need to do to keep someone at home. But also, do we have enough staff? Do we have enough people out there who are aides and nurses and therapists who are going to be coming into these homes? So both of those two things are crunching. Um, In New York, we have a number of hospice residences. And I think that there's some hope that there might be a payment structure that could be created to allow for the hospice residents to be the place when you can't care for yourself and your loved ones are all too tired, exhausted, scared, um, have to work, then maybe you can go to a hospice residence. But today, the hospice residence is paid for out of pocket, and most people can't afford to do that. In New York and in many states, Medicaid eligible people can have hospice paid for, um, the residential care setting paid for, but none of the other insurances do that. Medicare doesn't. So I think there's opportunity in the future to reinvent hospice in allowing for a residential level of care. And let's talk about the the payment structure first because that comes up a lot. Um, The payment structure kind of is what it is. It's, you know, one payment structure, but it doesn't really take into account of, um, you know, patient A, you know, has a daughter and a son that, you know, can be there and, you know, the nurse, you know, has to go out there, or case manager has to go out there, or patient B that has nobody and needs a higher level of care. 
um, I know there's been a lot of talk in the industry of, you know, hey, that's not fair because it's not situational. And we actually just recorded a show on social determinants. And I think that's going to come into play more because if you've got somebody that has, you know, a live-in relative that can be there is different than somebody that, you know, is in a rural demographic that has nobody that can bring a meal by or make sure, you know, the care's there. Um, do you see that? I mean, how is that? Do you see that as being a big issue? Do you see if there's going to be change in the payment based on some of the social determinants? I, you know, I, I have some hope that there will be payment structure changes because of the social determinants of care, all of the stuff that CMMI is looking at. Um, the reality is if you can't stay at home, if you don't have enough structural support to stay at home, what will happen to you? You will go into a nursing home and eventually we will be paying for that nursing home. No matter how much money you have, the majority of us can't pay for a nursing home for custodial care for very long. So now we all will have Medicaid. Right. Um, it, we can't afford to have that happen when we could save money by keeping you in your house. So I'm seeing people are starting to get creative. Many of the insurance companies have a lot of creative systems out there that will hit the social determinants, will allow more hours of care. Um, uh, you know, I had a loved one just recently come home, at, not a hospice patient, um, went, to a, went to a rehab only because in her living situation, she would have been home for nine hours. Yep. And if an aide had come in every day for one hour during that, we could have saved the, the rehab cost, but Medicare preferred to pay the rehab cost. In the end, we're going to have to figure out how to make that work because all of these hospice patients who are home alone will all end up in a nursing home. I can't afford that. Yep. And it's not the right thing to do. Yeah, I know. I, I feel you. I'm dealing with the same situation right now, and it just irritates me to no end because, you know, you're forcing people to take them into the ED to then, deter, you know, beat the system to say, okay, well, you can get 20 days in this facility. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're, you're anybody that's, you know, somewhat smart on the system you're driving the healthcare costs up one way or the other to try to bake the system to right. get reimbursement. Exactly. I also see that there'll be some opportunity for more communal care. Yeah. So if it's not a hospice house, you know, we have comfort care homes that have opened all over New York. Two people, um, you know, somebody, a group of volunteers allowing two people to live in their home for no reimbursement. Hospice goes in and helps, but Basically, it's kind of a congregate care setting. So maybe you're going to start seeing a number of seniors moving in together. Yeah. And then when one of them is dying, then the others can take care of them. So That's I think that the whole configuration of how we live is going to have to change into the future. There are too many of us baby boomers, isn't it? Yeah. You know, really. And Gen Z and Gen Xers trying to, you know, work and do all that. And, you know, it's a full-time job from that perspective. So I want to talk a little bit about the technology side of things. I think when people think of telehealth, they think of, you know, reimbursement, right? And kind of the revenue opportunity. And it's thought out very differently from a hospice standpoint of it's more um, operational efficiencies, and you know, being able to get kind of more of the margin of, of the payout in the sense of we've had you know, an increase in, we live in this world where everything's now an instant, right? And you have caregivers that are used to technology and instantaneous. I think we've you know, incorrectly stereotyped older generations to say they won't use technology, right? Because very incorrectly. Very incorrectly, yes. And, you know, there's been many studies that have come out to say that that's not true, right? Don't stereotype an entire generation. Um, we talked on an earlier podcast today that, you know, a 65-year-old is very different than an 85-year-old. So don't classify the entire generation as non-technology. But I think that we're starting to see it now, and I think we'll see it more as in a hospice scenario, you know, the change of condition calls, especially when we're talking now home health, you know, it's this air traffic control, right, of trying to figure out, do you really need a nurse there right now? You know, if I could see that patient, I would know that, yeah. you know, this caregiver has never been through hospice before. And this heavy breathing is maybe not end of life the last couple of days. It's because of X, Y, Z. Right. And remote monitoring technology now. You've got telehealth now. 
like how should hospice executives be thinking about utilizing this from an efficiency standpoint of you know mileage air traffic control you know things like that versus a billable event yeah, see, in hospice, we have no billable events exactly. you know, in reality. So you're not, you're not saving anything if you don't make a visit. But what you're injuring is your patient satisfaction, your family anxiety, the 911 call that you don't want to have happen. Yeah. All happens when they've called in and they haven't gotten an answer on something. Right. So I see the use. And in, in, in the program that I ran pr prior to coming here, um, we actually just um, use telehealth for those patients and families that we knew were very nervous. Yeah. Um, and when they called, we could see them and they could see us. We could talk, we, we knew whether we needed to talk them down from the ledge or whether we needed to run out and make sure that they didn't fall off of the ledge. Right, um, right. So I think that that consumer satisfaction, which is ever presently an issue within hospice because we have publicly reported domains and you want families to be able to say, of course, and you want for your own future, you want families to say, you know, they wrapped their arm around me and I didn't have to worry about anything after I got hospice on board. That's what you want them to say. To be able to visualize them when they can see the calm nurse as they're waiting for another nurse to drive an hour to get to them. I see that is even bigger than, you know, the air traffic control, which is very important. Um, yeah. But that hit that you get of being able to calm people and to start an intervention prior to getting there. Right, no, I think that's critical. And the, the other thing that I think we don't talk about a lot is really the workforce, right? So in healthcare, we're already at competitive, lowest unemployment rate, people jumping ship, you know, mm -hmm. shortage all across the board. And then you have the burnout side, right? And especially in yeah. hospice, I mean, it takes a very strong person to be in hospice, right? You're dealing with death day after day after day, right? Yeah. And so when you put in a situation where you're literally just kind of running from home to home, facility to facility, if you're able to take a step back and, and you know, instead of going to, you know, five places a day, take it to maybe three because two were unnecessary trips, right. you also can, what we don't talk about is like the employee retention side, the work-life balance side, that kind of thing. Where do you kind of, do you see that playing into it? Uh, definitely. You know, you as a nurse, we're competing with people who can pay way more than we can. Yeah. So in some parts of New York, there's a six and seven and eight dollar premium on a hospital pay yeah. that the nurse in the home or, you know, in the hospice setting doesn't get. So how do you compete with that? You give them all the tools they need to do their job so that at the end of the day, they can say, I have made a difference. I like this job. And telehealth, that video display of uh, being able to do a visit is a piece of that toolbox. And I think that nurses are much more satisfied yeah. and social workers um, and even chaplains when they can't get to somebody, when they can see them or when they can touch base and yeah. see them um, and look at the patient. And so I think that it will improve the employee satisfaction and retention is improved when you're satisfied. Yeah, and definitely. It's a big issue in, in all over the country. One of the questions we got for the podcast, which I don't know that I agree with, but I'd love to get your opinion on, yeah. is that, and I think it goes back to this, you know, uh, classifying an entire class stigma, but that hosp hospice nurses are older and they don't know how to use technology, so they wouldn't <laughs> be able to do telehealth. Uh, what do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You made me cough. Um, yeah, hospice nurses tend to be older, um, but they're really good on their iPhones and their Androids, yeah, exactly. and they can definitely use telehealth. Almost all of them are on some kind of electronic medical record. Right. Um, so even though one of our concerns with hospice is that it tends to be the older, more mature nurse yeah. that gets into the hospice field, um, so hospice nurses tend to be in their 40s and 50s, not 20s and 30s. Um, although we have a bunch of new ones coming on board because it is the whole theory of nursing practice that you see in hospice. It's 
body, mind, and soul, treating the family as a unit of care. It is everything that I learned in the 70s when I went to college to become a nurse. So there is some satisfaction in being in that level of nursing care. Um, so we are attracting some, but I, I, I say whoever asked that question probably needs to sit with a 50-year-old nurse and um, um, watch them go through all of these apps that we've given them on their phones. They have apps that um, cross-check medications. Um, they have apps that um, check check blood pressure, and they've got little machines that check their the pulse ox and the um, the pro times or the blood clotting factors. So uh, we, they're really pretty high tech. Yeah. So the one other thing, um, having just gone through um, hospice myself with the as being a caregiver, the one thing you know, being in this space, the one thing that that I thought about from a customer satisfaction standpoint, and I want to get your thoughts on is you got everything coming at you at, at, you know, at one time and you're pulled in so many directions of you now got, you know, these calls from hospice nurses, case managers, you know, you're filling out this, you know, thick paperwork that you're not reading because you're in distress, right? Yeah. You don't really know kind of the support that's available, whether it's chaplain, bereavement, like, you know, the person told it to you, but you've got 7,000 things going on in your brain and you kind of don't remember it. And yeah. you're, you're with that loved one. So you really can't take the time to maybe go talk to a chaplain or talk to a mental health professional. And then when, you know, when you do have that loss, you're now trying to plan you know, funerals and nursing, you know, you're trying to do all this at once. And what I was thinking about it, you know, in my scenario is, you know, maybe I would have talked to a chaplain if I could have done it through video. Maybe I would have talked to a mental health if I was in the room or I could step out, but I didn't have the driving time to go somewhere right. when I need to be at arm's length here. And so as I thought about the future of hospices, like this concierge type model where, I could connect, you know, are you Catholic? Are you Baptist? Are you, you know, here, we have somebody that you can connect to. You can step out and go to the other room and talk to mm -hmm. them, but you don't have to physically leave and go. Because in some areas, if you don't have that existing relationship, they're not really going to come to you. Um, and, you know, maybe you don't have funeral arrangements planned. Maybe you could talk to a couple of people and then decide, I'd rather go to A than B or C, and kind of narrow it down. Am I crazy in my thinking? No, I think that the ability to do these video visits is going to be very helpful. I mean, most of the hospice staff will come to you when you're with your loved one. Right. Um, but then sometimes you don't want to leave for that long. You want a much shorter conversation with them. Right. Um, maybe you want the volunteer to be able, you know, to talk to two different volunteers who have helped people with the different funeral arrangements so that they can both give you. Um, you can get access to that on a video um, much faster and in a time frame that's easier, I think, for you. Yeah, more well convenient. So I, I see a lot of opportunity to be able to do it that way. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as a, as a caregiver myself recently, I didn't want to leave the room. I would have gone out into the other room for like 10 minutes, but I wouldn't have gone. If somebody had come in to say, I'm going to make a visit with you, um, they would have taken too much of my time to do that. I, I thought the same way. Kind of focused. Yep. Um, so I refused a lot of those visits because I, I didn't did too. feel like I had the time. I, I, I totally agree. Um, well, good. We always close the show with what's one thing healthcare related that's keeping you up at night. What's keeping you up at night, Carla? Um, I think it's that the rules and regulations keep coming down at us, yet the creativity to create a whole new model um, is taking so long. Um, we've been working with CMS for 10 years to have a concurrent care model so that you can have hospice and traditional care because yeah. that dichotomy of you can have everything you want, or you can have hospice. It's too much for people to make that decision they don't understand. Yeah. So to me is we're still not there, and that keeps me up at night is you shouldn't have to say, oh, I'll never go back to the hospital again, or I don't want this treatment. You should let hospice work you through being comfortable, and then you can make your choices to when you stop your treatments. And right. not, but to do that, you need to change our payment structure. Yeah. I totally so that's agree. That's what keeps me up. 
Well, awesome. It has been so great to have you on the show, Carla. Thank you for all your great insights. Um, it has been uh, really a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Bye. First, I want to talk a little bit. We've got seniors that are aging at home and really more Gen Zs that are becoming caregivers, kind of getting really more involved with the health care of their loved ones. And that seniors wanting to really age at home shortage of long-term care facilities. And that's really kind of changing hospice and the need to innovate to service more folks as well as servicing the caregivers. So Dr. Neal, I really want to ask you, where do you see the big kind of shortage and differences right now of folks wanting to have hospice in a facility versus in home? And do you think we'll see the difference that in the future? Thank you for having me on the show. Um, basically, what I feel is more and more things, the Gen X, especially the Gen X people taking care of their loved ones, they want everything instantly. So according to me, it's moving towards more in-home care. Actually, medicine as such is going back to the homes. So, uh, you know, so innovation is very important at this point where everything is instant. So hospice care definitely is more needed in this um, in this era especially at home because it's where the caregiver is everybody works from home you know everything is at home so i think the home model needs to be more uh, you know it should be more uh, of in home hospice than facility because you know at the end of uh, life care what happens is you know people want to be home that is the truth. They know what is the consequence. They know what is the disease progressing into. You know, and, and you know, instead of being in a facility, they prefer to be at home in their own bed, it look, looked after by their family. So I think it is very important. And coming to the innovation part of it, I think telehealth is very important in hospice care at this point. Yeah, and let's talk about that. You guys are doing some really innovative stuff, not only with telehealth, but with Alexa and with some other really innovative, historically hospice has not been as innovative technology wise, a lot to do with kind of the pay model. Um, but hospice organizations are starting to figure out more that they can innovative and it's not as much about the billable code side, but it's about, you know, efficiencies in workers, case managers, nurses, the palliative care docs. Tell me a little bit about the, and how you kind of got to the innovation side with your hospice organization and kind of what you guys are doing innovation wise. So basically what we we call it the console connect. That's what we call it. So it's like, a, it's, it's similar to an Alexa console. So what happens is uh, the program runs through the console and it's placed in every patient's home. And, uh, you know, we are, we have a call center backup that has uh, all trained PAs and nurses who are there. So how does this help is like, you can really assess the visits you have to make from the end and you can check on your patients every day. Like, in, you know, it's like daily rounds, which like at the hospital. So it, right. it's equal to uh, in facility. They are at home though. So, and then for example, what do we do is like, I'm going to give you a case scenario. Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones in case if you, like, for example, you forgot to take your medication. This uh, app reminds them to take their medication. And in case the patient doesn't take the medication, there is two or three prompts going to the thing. And then this connects to the primary caregiver saying, hey, your mom has forgot the medication. You know, that's, that's what we uh, see at uh, our innovation model. And not only that, uh, it reduces the anxiety. The caregiver doesn't have to go to the ED or readmissions. Whenever a symptom occurs, they just have to say, you know, Alexa, can you connect me to the so-and-so person? So it connects to the nurses who are trained RNs at the call center. And like how you do a on-call service, that's what they do. They try to um, take care, troubleshoot it right away. Or if there is a need, then you send out whoever the qualified personal has to go. So then you, you can understand better what is the needs. It reduces anxiety. And not only that, it makes you connect to a lot of people. Uh, for example, there is a primary caregiver, you know, mom, 
uh, mom is in hospice, there's a primary caregiver, but what happens is the primary caregiver doesn't talk to somebody else in the family, but at this moment, the patient can choose to talk to whoever who they want to talk to through this app. Yeah, that's great, and I think we're going to see more and more of that because as we think about it, you have a lot of these caregivers that the first time of hospice that a there's a lot of change in condition that occurs and it's not necessarily that someone needs to go out into the home instantly but as a hospice kind of executive you have to look at you know really kind of i like to call it the air traffic controller of yes. we need to go here here second here third and as we have more and more people aging at home and needing hospice it's really about telehealth and and technologies like you guys have implemented with kind of the Alexa solution. It's really about providing that higher level of care, but also decreasing the anxiety of the caregiver yes. that it might not be an emergency, but you need to be able to see you know it's not an emergency. So where do you see that headed in the future of kind of this air traffic control kind of remote monitoring telehealth of so what I, from my understanding, is that cost, you know, all hospices are always about the cost. Current pay model, they say that how to cost cut, how to budget, because hospices mostly it is not paid enough. That's what is the consideration to, you know, to survive the or to give more patient care, more quality of care to patients. So by bringing in telehealth, I think the payment, like, I mean, the payment structure now as you know, you can only do so many visits, but with, with this coming in, more visits to the patient, more quality of care. Uh, the chaperone is reachable right away. Travel of the chaperone, travel of travel time of your nurses, travel time of the chaplains, all that comes down. And bereavement can be given constantly through through this particular service, through telehealth. You know, that's that's what I feel. You can have more access to your patient with a less cost. This podcast has come to a close. To hear more from the Executive Innovation Show podcast, subscribe, submit questions, and share the love. Follow us on social. We're everywhere.